Welcome to your Powers of Congress video notes. Today we're going to be focusing on differentiating between the expressed and implied powers of Congress. So we know that Congress can make laws. We learned that last semester when we looked at the Constitution, um, laid out the articles, when we talked about the three powers of any government in the world that they have, legislative, executive, and judicial, and we talked about what each one of those meant. But what other powers does Congress have under the authority of the Constitution? What powers does Congress give it that kind of fall under that umbrella of making laws? And are there any things Congress can do that is kind of outside the scope of making laws? There are two types of congressional powers. There's express powers, and they're specifically listed in the Constitution. Sometimes these are also referred to as enumerated powers. So off to the side, maybe write enumerated. And then there are implied powers. And these are not written in the Constitution, but these things need to happen or be occurring um, in order to carry out the expressed powers. So implied powers are rooted in expressed powers. If they're not, then they're probably not gonna be allowed. So implied powers are actually a part of the expressed powers in the fact that there is a necessary and proper clause that is listed in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, um, Clause 18 is the necessary and proper clause. And it basically says Congress has the power to make all laws that are necessary to carry out the Constitution. It also, it's also known as the Elastic Clause. Why do you think it's now called the Elastic Clause? Think about what an elastic does, okay, and how that might be applying to implied powers. Jot that down on the paper. It's something I'm going to be looking for. So an example, if the Constitution expressly stated, all citizens shall own a car provided by the government, what implied powers would come along with this? Did you think of anything? I immediately went to what kind of car? Like a toy car or a big car that's gotta be parked in the garage that I'm gonna drive down the road, right? Does that also mean that I need to have a driver's license? Like, can I drive that car um, or can I just own it, right? If I just can own it, then there's gotta be another law that says that I can't just drive the car because I own it, right? Who pays for the upkeep? Okay, those are all be kind of like falling under the implied powers that would be attached, that would be rooted in this all citizens shop, you know, are owning, gonna own a car provided by the government. Um, do I get to pick the car? Or is, they, like, is there a standard issue? Okay, so, okay, so some important expressed powers of Congress. Now that we understand that there's expressed powers that are listed and then there's implied powers that branch off of that. Um, so what are some of those expressed powers? Well, there's the power to tax. Why do we need a tax? Well, we need to meet public needs. People want to be protected. We have to pay for a um, for um, defense. There's the word I'm looking for. And uh, you know, we have to pay for defense. We have to pay for people to help run the various government agencies. Um, whether or not we have too many of them, that's a question for another day. But people are not going to do those jobs for free. We have to pay for them, right? So we need money. And if we got to have money, then you know, how do we collect money? How does the federal government collect money? Get money. They have to tax it. Okay. There is direct and indirect taxes. So direct taxes are like sales tax or income tax. You know it's coming. You see it coming out of your check um, or you see it on the sales receipt. Sales tax would be a state level. Um, income tax is federal and state. Um, but indirect tax are the is the money that we pay um, for an item that goes to pay the tariff that was applied to that. If it was imported in, then there's a tariff on that item. And we, the consumers, are paying for it. It's just included in the price. And then there's sales tax added on top of that. Okay, borrow money. We need to borrow money. Sometimes we um, spend more than we bring in. Sometimes we know we're gonna do that. Many a times anymore, we know we're gonna spend more than we bring in. But sometimes there's also, um, you know, we all of a sudden have a very big national event. Like all of a sudden we get involved in a war and we're spending more money to pay for that war. We need to be able to borrow money to cover those costs. And we're going, the federal government is going to borrow money from citizens or other countries. And 
most of the United States debt, the largest portion of the United, of the United States debt is actually owed to the US citizens. Like it's money that we've borrowed from ourselves. Um, yes, we borrow from other countries, China, Japan, etc. but most of our money is owed to the US citizens. And then they also have another very important expressed power um, that um, you know gets brought into um, the court system a lot is to regulate interstate commerce. So interstate commerce is basically overseeing business between states. And the issue is what is deemed business, right? Is it the sale of goods? Is it the exchange of goods? Is it um, a person traveling from out of state and is coming to stay at your motel or eating at your restaurant? All of that, according to the federal government, um, Supreme Court is business. And Congress, is, if it's something that could happen, um, a person from another state could take part in, then it can be regulated by Congress. Um, example of this, uh, a couple examples would be Amazon charging sales tax um, because states require it. Um, Oklahoma has a law that we collect that Amazon has to collect sales tax um, from purchases and then they turn it over to the state. Um, Gibbons v. Ogden had to do with shipping. We're going to look at this in um, detail in class, but Gibbons v. Ogden is a, you know, a Supreme Court case in which um, the Supreme Court had to weigh in in how much does the interstate commerce, like what, like how far does that go? What does that include? What type of businesses? Um, and the Supreme Court pretty much gave a very broad definition of what is included in commerce, but it does have to be the um, exchange of goods and services. Um, and then the Civil Rights Act of 1964 also used the um, interstate commerce power to establish itself that businesses, private businesses, could not discriminate based on race, ethnicity, or religion. All right, important expressed powers of Congress. Some other ones here that we kind of need to know. Um, Congress has the right to, has the power, not the right, but the power to declare war. The president can request it, but Congress can say no. Um, and just so you know, this is to prevent the single executive from abusing their power and using the military to basically become an authoritarian. Um, print money, they're the ones who are deciding um, what our money looks like, the dom denominations, um, how much, you know, how much will be on each one, who will be on each one, the makeup of it, all of those sorts of things. Um, post offices, how many post offices we have. Small rural communities de like depend on their post offices to give themselves like a chance at survival in like a small rural in a rural area. And then copyrights, they determine like the copyright laws. So protections um, from um, somebody else taking works of art. So this is paintings, this is music, this is written, um, those sorts of things and patents, which are inventions. And I always joke about the Pirate Party of America, but the Pirate Party of America is all about piracy. They believe that there should not be copyrights or patents. And then they also can do intimate domain, which is the power to take private property for public use. They pay you, the federal government will pay you, and the state governments have this power too, but they have to pay you, and, but it's not gonna be fair market value. It's not gonna be what you could have gotten for that property if you sold it yourself to somebody else. Okay, because you're essentially selling it to the federal government and they're not going to use it for the intended purpose. They're going to change it into something else like a highway. All right, so back to that declared versus undeclared war. I need you to understand that the red on this timeline are declared wars. Okay, and the blue are undeclared wars. And you're going to look at this and you're going to be like, Vietnam, what? I, that's a war. We call it a war. And Gulf War, and wait, Afghanistan to, you know, from 2001 till present till 2021. I'm like, yes. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, the blue, it's just there was an official declaration of war from Congress, but they did do a authorized use 
of military force, which is known as an AUMF. So it basically it's like a declaration of war, but it's not a declaration of war. So it's all semantics on wording. They authorize these military instruction um, and um, it exercises. They also paid for them. They also included money in the budget to cover them. So while there was an official declaration of war, we were still using military force and Congress authorized it. Now, what I want you to do, because remember, we are, this is about can we differentiate between expressed power and implied powers? So I want you to take a moment to think of what could be some implied powers that would fall under the power to tax, okay, and declare war and print money and post offices. Like what are some other things that Congress could do that are going to be rooted into those main expressed powers? I want you to pause the video and you know, think of this, try to come up with some suggestions. This is what I'm gonna be looking for when I look over your notes. <clears throat> Okay, so we've talked about the legislative powers of Congress um, and those fall into expressed and implied, but Congress also has some non-legislative powers, meaning these are powers that do not have to do with lawmaking, um, but the founding fathers felt like they needed to go somewhere and Congress was the best choice. Um, so constitutional amendments, the president is not involved in constitutional amendments. It is all on Congress. Congress has to propose it and then it goes to the states. So the branch that represents the people in the states are the ones who are going to start the constitutional amendment. They are the ones that are dealing with the electoral college. They are the ones that are like if the electoral college doesn't, you know, have a winner, then we set, then, then Congress steps in to, you know, complete that process. Impeachment, holding our government officials accountable in the executive and judicial branches. And it is 100% all in Congress. The House has their part of, you know, deciding if um, there should be a charge of impeachment, if the elected official have violated their oath of office. And then the Senate, who is going to hold the trial, who are going to hear the evidence and determine if the individual is guilty of the charge. That essentially violates the, their terms, their oath of office, or they are high crimes and misdemeanors. And whatever that term means is up to Congress. And then they have the power to investigate. And they're going to hold hearings. So this is where they're going to hold government agencies accountable um, oftentimes. So why did they do what they did? To understand actions taken by other individuals, but they also are gonna do power to investigate certain businesses. They are doing power to investigate on whether or not they need to do some regulations on social media. Back in the early 2000s, they did investigative hearings on steroids and baseball. <clears throat> okay, so do we need to basically does Congress need to pass some laws um, to ensure that this action never happens again or, you know, is something is needed? Um, but this is also like uh, with Hillary Clinton, they had um, a hearing to determine why the attack on the embassy in Benghazi, Libya occurred and w were there um, places where, you know, Congress can step in and pass some regulations to ensure that that sort of situation doesn't happen again. Now, finally, there are some, a couple other powers that the federal government gets called inherent powers. Um, and these powers are that all governments have, but are, don't have to be spelled out. Um, and these are just because we're a sovereign country, we have these powers. The two big ones is the control of the borders, so immigration, and agreements with other nations. The debate comes on whether or not these fall under legislative or executive. And in the United States, like controlling borders, immigration policy is established by Congress, but it's enforced by the president. And how is that enforcement done is going to change with president to president. Um, agreements with other nations. So the president establishes a treaty, but the Senate has to approve said treaty. So again, our constitution puts them um, kind of split in between the two branches, but there is question on where, really where do those powers truly lie. And then the constitution, I mean, 
If it's not written in the Constitution, then the federal government get, doesn't get to do it. But there are a couple of powers that Congress really, not Congress, the Founding Fathers really wanted to make sure that were very clear they could not do. Okay, and so denied powers are powers that Congress does not have. They were very specific in here. So like Congress cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Um, this is basically where you go before a judge and you are told um, if you have a writ of habeas corpus, then you go before a judge and they, are to they tell you what you're being charged with. If you suspend that, that means you can just throw people in jail and leave them there. Um, Lincoln suspended this. Congress did not, but Lincoln as the executive did during the Civil War because it was war. No one, I mean, there were some challenges, but they didn't go anywhere. And the Supreme Court hasn't truly weighed in on whether or not that action was allowed. Um, but just know it's been done before, but it was done by the president and not by Congress. Bill of Attainder. So this is where Congress cannot issue a punishment. So Congress cannot say, hey, you know, these group of people have broken the law and we're punishing them to X, like establishing what their punishment would be, because that is a judicial power. So Congress cannot do that. They can establish that if someone is convicted of a crime, here's their punishment. But then to actually apply it to a person or group of people, it has to be done by the Justice Department or not the Justice Department, the Justice Branch. And then ex post facto laws, if you do something like back in the 1970s females could drink at age 18 in the state of oklahoma the late 70s it was changed to 21. so all the females that drank at 19 say in 1971 cannot be charged with a crime because in 1977 it was illegal for a 19 year old to drink Okay, so ex post facto laws means that you cannot make somebody, you cannot punish someone for doing something that at the time was not a crime. Okay, all right, so here's kind of a quick overview of the powers of Congress. Um, we'll be talking about them a little more in depth and working with them in class, so make sure you have these notes. And again, don't do anything too stupid. Bye, guys.